I want you to join me by grabbing your Bible, if you will, please. John 17. You know, John 17 is really such a special chapter. Uh, in some ways, I'm a little fearful because I don't want to misrepresent anything that Jesus would pray. It's that important. You remember how it ended there in the last few verses of chapter 16. He's trying to prepare his disciples that he's going to be going soon. And uh, they partially get it, but not really. And uh, they tell him that we understand. We know. We believe that you came from God. We believe. And Jesus says to them in verse 31 of chapter 16, do you now believe? He's a little incredulous. He said, behold, the hour cometh and now is. You'll be scattered, every one of you. You'll leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone. My father is always with me. These things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation. But be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then the first verse of chapter 17 says, these words spake Jesus and then lifted up his eyes toward heaven. And he said, Father, the hour has come. So many times in the gospel of John, we are told, and Jesus himself says it, my hour is not yet come. The time is not ready yet, but now it's ready. His death is really pending. So no matter what Jesus predicted would happen later that evening, he was, and he still is, the overcomer. He says, I have overcome the world, his last words before this prayer begins. I have overcome the world. And so this is the overcomer's prayer that we're privileged to listen in on. I believe that this prayer by our Lord is really the basis for any success that believers have in spreading the gospel worldwide, here or anywhere, of making disciples. It's based upon his prayer. And the indestructibility of the living New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is tied tightly to this prayer. It's a tremendous privilege that the Holy Spirit has seen fit to record our Savior's prayer for us to read. And as a result, we all get to hear what was on Jesus's heart hours before he died as our sacrifice on that tree. This prayer, the bulk of it is really for the disciples the 11 that are left, Judas is peeled off as the betrayer. The bulk of it is for those 11 men, but some of it applies to, some of it is for us as well. And whatever he prayed even for those disciples applies to us too. Have you paused to think about the fact that Jesus prays for people? He prays for his own people. If you're a believer, obviously we know that. He ever lives to make intercession for us. But he prays for the world too. He prays for people that aren't saved. He prays for people to be brought to faith through you and me. And that's what really the bulk of this prayer is about. So I want us to pray before we look any further. Heavenly Father, just so thankful for this prayer. Yeah. Just amazing when we stop and think about it and listen to the precious heart of Jesus that unfolds to us in his words recorded in this prayer. Lord, would you draw us to yourself this morning as we listen in to what you have to say? Lord, thank you for your praying. Thank you. We don't pray like we should, but Lord, you always pray like you should. 
and you prayed here like you should. You prayed on the, the, the days of your flesh on this earth, and you continue to pray for us. And so we know nothing will ever be able to separate us who are believers from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We praise you for that. No condemnation. We ask that you'd open our eyes, open our spiritual hearts, insert into them precisely what you choose, that we might come away from this time knowing that we've met with you. We've heard from you. You've spoken to us. Lord, do your will. Be poured out upon us and in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Central to Jesus' prayer in this chapter is his glory and the glory of his Father. I say it's three, there's triple G's here in this chapter. He prays about glory, he prays about giving, and he prays about his global burden. And so I want to, first of all, in the beginning of the first five verses, as a matter of fact, see how he prays about glory. That is his father's glory and his own glory. Notice this, how he prays, he says, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy son, that thy son may glorify thee. The glory of God is very important in his prayer. Five times he talks about the glory. Five times in this chapter, in this prayer of his. But look at the time, first of all, in that first verse. The hour has come. The hour in which Jesus said, I will be glorified. And as a result of that, Father, you're going to be glorified. What hour is he talking about? His total focus at this point is on what he is about to do on that cross. He's focused on the cross. He's focused upon his redemption that he will be that substitute, that sacrificial substitute, that through that substitution, he will glorify the Lord. He'll glorify his father and himself. It's That really is what is at the heart of God's redemption plan. When you read it in the scripture, when you get to the book of Revelation, all the redemption plan comes to a, a com culmination and a completion, and it's all about his glory. There's glory that is being given to him. The time for that had come. And the great part of his glory is the fulfillment of the redemption plan on that tree. And then if you'll look with me as we read on, he says in verse two, as thou hast given him, that is Jesus power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. This is eternal life. We'll get to this in a moment. He said, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O oh Father, verse 5, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. All about glory. And it's not just glory in time. But it, he's talking about, in verse 5, glory for all eternity. God exists outside of time, of course. He's eternal. And so the Father's glory and Jesus' glory is eternal glory. Jesus is God that stepped into time, but there was never a time when he was not glorious. Now his glory was veiled, but occasionally that curtain was lifted. Remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, when his clothing glowed with the Shekinah glory of God, I believe, as he lifted the veil just a little to show his true glory of who he really was. And because he did, you and I 
share in that glory. Isn't that amazing? We share his glory. In fact, we share his glory now, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but in verse 22, here what he, here's what he prays. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, believers. And uh, that's right here and now. We share God's glory now. And we'll talk about how that actually is a reality. But also, we'll share his glory forever, eternally. Look at verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. When we behold his glory with him in glory, we'll share that glory forever with him. It's an amazing prayer. And then... Beginning in verse 2 and really down to verse 24, there are 17 times. In 22 verses, there are 17 times that he uses the verb give, giveth, gave. And the context of what he means is what has been accomplished because of what his father gave him. And then in turn, what he would give to his disciples or has given to his disciples. So it's about God's glory, but God's glory revealed in what God gives. And in verse 2, there's the first thing that he gives. And thou hast given him, that is, the Father has given the Son, the Lord Jesus, power over all flesh. He's given him power. Of course, we know that Jesus is the creator of all flesh. He's the creator of all things. And as a result of his crucifixion and resurrection, when he was ready to ascend, he said, all authority is mine in heaven and in earth. So God has given, the Father has given to his son all authority over human life, over all flesh. But also, he's given him the power or the authority that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. The Father has given to Jesus the Son the authority to give life. As the Redeemer, he's the only way that any human being can ever obtain eternal life. Eleven of the original disciples chose to obtain eternal life through faith in Jesus. One didn't, didn't pan out, but the rest did. You see, I think sometimes we talk about salvation as something that is just nebulous or a a thing, you know, I'm saved, I have salvation. You can't disconnect salvation from Jesus. He is salvation. In fact, that's what the name Jesus means. And he is eternal life. This same Apostle John, when he wrote his first letter in the first uh, uh, chapter, and I think the second verse, he says he gives Jesus his name. He is eternal life. And so what we are seeing here is that Jesus has been given the authority to give eternal life because he is eternal life. You should understand that salvation is much more than just the forgiveness of sin and a free ride to heaven, as sadly some people see it. It is a personal relationship with this Savior, with our God. Eternal life is a personal thing. It's in a person. It's not something outside of him. He is eternal life. And there is no salvation unless you are personally connected and have a vital living relationship with Jesus. He's been given the power to give life because he is life eternal. Look what else he's been given. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. He's been given a work by the Father. And he's saying here, I have fulfilled my earthly mission. 
I fulfilled the redemption plan. And he is, of course, anticipating the fact that he will soon die on that cross and three days later would rise again and then ascend and sit on the throne. But I finished my earthly work. I, I brought it to completion. God gave him a work. God gave him a mission. And he finished it. He completed it. But here's the, the really the bulk of the chapter in that God gave him something else. Look at verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast given, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So he gave to Jesus, the Father gave to Jesus power. He gave to Jesus life. He gave to Jesus work. Here he gives to Jesus men. Actually, there were 12 of them. This is a reference to the original 12 disciples. They later became known as apostles, sent ones. These men are the disciples. In fact, in verse 12, it becomes very clear that that's what he's talking about. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost with the exception of, but the son of perdition, that's Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So in the context, the father giving these men to Jesus is not a reference to salvation, but rather to the mission. God gave these men to Jesus for the mission. And that mission we're going to see is world evangelism. Judas selfishly and unknowingly advances God's plan of redemption by selling Jesus out as a traitor. He sets up the crucifixion, which is really the, vic the victory of Jesus over Satan and all of his forces. And by the way, that last uh, phrase of verse 12, none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. You need to understand that while God knew that was going to happen beforehand, that does not mean that God determined it to happen beforehand. You look at the way Jesus dealt with Judas and he was very sweet with him, very patient with him, trying to woo him away from what he knew would be his uh, evil plan. So what else did he give? What else did the father give? Well, go back to that sixth verse again. He says, I've manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me. Verses 25 and 26, he talks about the fact that these have known your name. Verse 26, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. Jesus is a great I am. We know that John's gospel has seven I am's in it, right? You know what they are? We've covered all of them. One of the latest ones is I am the resurrection, right? And the life. I am the true vine. But those seven I am's, what he is doing is he's saying, I'm the equivalent of that one that Moses met at that burning bush. And Moses asked, who shall I say sent me? Tell them I am that I am sent thee. It's the living God. And he is saying, I'm the I am. And in fact, Jesus, John says, is actually the one that exegeses God the Father to us. In John 1 and verse 18, he expounds the Father to us. Remember Philip? In chapter 14, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and that would be sufficient. And Jesus says, Philip, I've been so long with you, and you're asking me to show you the Father? Don't you know that if you've seen me, you've heard my words, you've seen my works, you've seen the Father. Remember how he says in chapter 10, I and my Father are one. He is the complete disclosure of the Father. 
his character, his nature, who he is, what he's like. You want to know what God the Father is like? Look at Jesus. In fact, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that might be, says that he, Jesus, is the brightness of his person or, or image, and he is the exact replica, duplicate of God's person. And the phrase there is very interesting because it's like a, a, a cut, a stamp that is marked. And he is the duplicate of God the Father in that. Three persons, one God. What else? He says, I've given them the word which you have gave, uh, given to me. In verse 8, I've given unto them the words which thou gavest me. They received them. Thankfully, in verse 14, I have given them thy word. And uh, verse 17, sanctify them for thy word. Thy word is truth. 19, sanctified through the truth. God gave them the word. Jesus gave them the word. They believed the word of Jesus. They believed that Jesus was who he said he was. Whereas the world, as we read in that uh, four, 14th verse, I have given my word, the world hath hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not. The world rejects God's word. The wor the, the, it's worldly to neglect God's word. There's no place for the word of God in people whose hearts are worldly. Really, at the heart of all that God's doing is his word. There's no escaping it. His word is right at the center of everything that he is doing. You can't live a Christian life. Obviously, you can't become a Christian without the gospel that is a part of God's word. And you can't live the Christian life without the word of God. You have to let it into your entire soul, into your mind, into your thinking. You have to let God's word also permeate uh, uh, your affections and become the thing that you love. You have to let God's word impact your will that you choose to do what God's word says. It's the way in which he sets his people apart. Now, this is interesting. In that 17th verse, he prays, sanctify them through thy truth. Now, we know that sanctify means set apart. But did you know that the word sanctify and the word holy are the same word? But only one other time uh, that uh, Jesus talks about holy in the Gospels uh, that I can think of, and that's when he warns, don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't give that which is holy to those that won't, won't appreciate it, in other words. Here he's praying for his people's holiness, and our holiness is tied to the word of God. Sanctify them. Make them holy through your truth. Your word is truth, he says, in that passage, the sanctifying word of God. You can't ignore God's word and live a holy life. Never happened. Never happened. In fact, your separation to God from this world is really contingent upon you being immersed in God's word and having God plant that word deep within you that it becomes a very part of your nature. Gave the word. And then look what else is given him. In verses 11 and 12, Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, verse 12, in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. Talking about the disciples, the apostles. And none of them is lost. 
I've kept them. Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil, not only the evil influences of the world, but actually the evil one who is behind all the evil in the world. So what is God given? What is Jesus? He's given the ability to keep, and he gives that to his father. Carefully guard them from evil, from the evil one. Again, he's praying for the disciples, but there's application for you and me here as well. You know what the Bible says about New Testament believers? We've been crucified to this world, and the world's been crucified. We've been cut off from this world, and the world's been cut off from us. If you're a believer, that's your position in the Lord Jesus. Crucified to the world, the world crucified to you. And as Jesus says in the last uh, phrase of verse 33 of chapter 16, I've overcome the world. And in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, he says, we overcome the world by our faith. By our faith in what? In him who overcame the world. That's how we're kept. We are in the world, but we're kept from being of the world. There is a little creature called a water spider. It's, he's like a scuba diver. He lives in freshwater rivers and streams. And fascinating how this species survives. It spins a basket-like web of silk. You might call it like a submarine. And uh, it anchors that down to plant life on the bottom of the stream or of the lake. And it, it takes a bubble on top of the water, sucks the oxygen out of it, and ejects that oxygen into that, that little uh, silk diving bell, I guess you might call it. And that's how it survives underwater. It's not in its element. It can't live in water without that, but it traps that air in that, uh, from that bubble in that to place where it lives. It's like us. We're living in a world that really is out to destroy us by its filth, by its, uh, uh, its wrong values and attitudes. It, 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 it could destroy us. How do we protect ourselves? How do we survive in such a hostile environment? Well, we have a bubble of protection. And that bubble of protection that we get our spiritual oxygen from is the word of God that sanctifies us and our communion with God through the Holy Spirit, fellowshipping with other believers, trusting God, walking by faith that is obeying his word because we're depending upon him. All of these things together insulate us and keep us in this evil world. And then there's another thing that that, uh, is given and that he gives. It's glory. Drop down to verse 22. Uh, The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. And this is a reference, I believe, to all believers. The glory thou hast given me, I have given to them. Jesus reveals the Father's glory, and the Spirit reveals Jesus. And uh, then his glory... Jesus' glory is revealed through us by his spirit that lives in us. So we share God's glory. I have given to them, he says, the glory which you gave me. I think that that is here and now. I don't think that that's in the future. I think verse 24 is about the future glory we will share. But I think we have a portion of that glory now. And here's what I mean. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says that we behold without a veil, with an open face, the glory of the Lord. And as we do so, we are changed from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory, and so on and so forth. In other words, we share God's glory. As we walk in the light, 
through steps of confession of sin and faith, we access a clean heart and a restored life. And as we then walk in the spirit by surrendering to the Lord and by depending upon the Lord, we access increasing and continual grace that equals God's glory. His glory is then evident in our lives. That's how it happens. We share it now. But also, ultimately, in verse 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. And of course, as I've said, when we behold his glory now, we're changed. Can you imagine when we see him as he is and behold his glory? We'll share ultimately in that glory eternally. And there's one more thing that I want to talk about in this chapter. It's the third G, and that is what he's praying, beginning in verse 20, really takes this whole thing global. Pick it up in verse uh, 20. He says, neither pray I for these alone, that is, the disciples, the original apostles, but also for them which shall believe on me through their word, the apostles' word. Now, I want you to line that verse up with verse 9, because in verse 9 he says, I pray for them. That's the original apostles. I pray not for the world. But now in verse 20 he says, okay, Now I'm going to add all those that will believe through these original apostles to my prayer. I'm going to pray for them, that they who will believe on me through the apostles' word. In the context, this is a support of the global gospel, which is from beginning to end nothing less than that. It begins globally in Genesis 12 when God chooses a man named Abram and says, through you, through your descendants, I'm going to bring spiritual blessing to all the families of this earth, to the nation. And that's exactly what you see pictured in the future in the book of Revelation that all nations, every tongue, every tribe, every family on the face of the earth there around the throne and the global plan has been completed then but there is in his prayer in that 20th and 21st verse we already looked at 22 and 24 but in in, uh, verse 20 where he's uh, he's praying for everyone that will believe based upon the words of the apostles. He prays, verse 21, that they and us, we'd all be one. We'd all be one. There's that prayer for unity. For the gospel to prosper globally, it really requires that believers understand and uh, practice spiritual unity. The 12 and all that become believers because of their message Jesus prays for all believers, unity. And the unity is based upon the fact that, not that we join together. You know, you don't have to believe as I believe. There are some things that you must believe in order to, to be a true Christian. We understand that. But the unity here is the fact that whether you agree with one another or not, if you are a blood bought, born again person, You have been spiritually joined to Christ. You are the recipient of God's glory that, of course, ends in that ultimate glory that we've talked about. The believer's unity is that you are spiritually, mystically joined to Christ. It's not something that you see or or feel, but it's something that's true. That no matter, as I said in the Salah moment, no matter where you live on the earth, what language you speak, what you look like, what your culture is, that if you are a born-again person, 
you are joined with Christ. And as a result, we're all members of the same family. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all brethren. That's that global unity. It reminds me of what uh, I read about John R. Rice. In one of his last messages, he had suffered a heart attack, and he was actually speaking from a wheelchair. And his text was John chapter 10, and that verse, Other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. And he mentioned other believers, which were not precisely aligned theologically with him. But nevertheless, they were believers too. And Dr. Rice, of course, uh, historically, he opposed Billy Graham's ministry because he did not like the fact that Dr. Graham was willing to work with unbelieving religious leaders. For example, when he came to New York City in 1957, he had Roman Catholic priests and everyone up on his platform supporting the meetings. Well, that didn't sit well with Dr. Rice. But when Billy Graham learned that uh, Dr. Rice was advertising some of his materials in a non-Christian publication, he mailed Rice a check for $500 to help his ministry. And when Dr. Rice went into the hospital with a heart attack, the first one to visit him was Billy Graham. You see, this unity is much greater than the doctrinal differences that we might have or practices that we might have. And I'm not, again, please understand, there are some doctrinal uh, points that have to be, have to be insisted upon, or we're not really believers, okay? Some fundamentals we have to agree on. What's the purpose of this unity? That's the question. And this is where I think we'll bring this all down to a landing. And if you'll note in verse uh, 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? Why do we need to practice in our daily lives spiritual unity that exists in believers? that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, he says. Verse 23, I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, complete in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. So here's the purpose of spiritual unity. You ready? Unified believers, living a unified life as believers, impacts the world. It reveals God's love so that the world sees the reality of the living Christ in his people, and they, be con they, they become convinced of their need. Remember chapter 16 and verse 7? I'm going to go away, but you're going to be better off because I'm going to send the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And remember we said how he does that is the indwelling Spirit in you as a believer is the means whereby the Spirit of God convicts the lost of their need. And the way in which that happens is that the lost sees the love of God in the spiritual unity of the believer. And they're drawn then to him for salvation because God so loved the world. You know, it's so it, it's such a, a misnomer to not see the whole context of his prayer and just see a verse 9 where he says, I pray not for the world. He prayed for the world in this prayer. That's his heart. That's his burden. It's a global heart that our God has. He just wasn't praying for the world at that moment. He was praying for the 12 at that point. But he prays for the world because God so loved the world, is what John tells us. That's the spiritual priority of his heart as you look at this prayer. God's glory, the sanctity, and the unity of his people that they might have a world impact 
of the message by both their life and, of course, their lip as well. All that Jesus has prayed either has been or will be answered. And when you line up your prayers with his, yours will be too. Because we're called as believers to partner with God in cooperation with the word of God and the Holy Spirit in his glory, in his sanctity, and his unifying work. You know what amazes me? is the many times that Jesus addresses in this prayer, Father. He begins with it, and he ends with it. In the first verse, Father, the hour has come. In uh, the 25th verse, O righteous Father, Father, I will, over and over again. You know, (laughs) the fatherhood of God God being a father is distinctive to Bible believing. No other religion has a God like this who is a father. Before he ever was a creator, he was a father. In fact, that's exactly what he says in that uh, uh, 24th verse. Father, he says, you loved me before the foundation of the world. God the Father and God the Son were in a love relationship, a family, loving family relationship before the foundation of the world, before there ever was a creation. Islam knows nothing of a God that is a father. Neither do other world religions, really. This is unique to Bible believers. Jesus calls him Father, and because we are joined to Christ, he is our Father. And he says, when you pray, pray, our Father. The wonderful privilege. We have a Father who, Paul says, is our Abba. He is our Papa. One of the most endearing terms that a child can call their earthly father, Papa or Daddy. And that's exactly what Paul says. That's the relationship that we as believers should have with Jesus and with our Heavenly Father. He is our Papa. A wonderful prayer. And again, a wonderful privilege to see what Jesus said. He said about you. He prayed for you. He prayed for every person in this world. They're included in that prayer. He continues to pray for you if you're one of his own. And if you don't know the Lord is your Savior... What in the world are you waiting for? Why would you not? Why would you not settle it? If you're not sure if you're a believer, why don't you make sure today? Because your father is calling you. And he's saying, come home. Come back to me. Because every human being needs to come back to God. We've wandered away. Return.